Hi, everybody. We've still got a few people coming in after lunch. Uh, I'll just um, start by introducing myself. My name is Anne Hollands. I'm the director of the Australian Institute of Family Studies, which for those of you who have never heard of us, we're sometimes known as APES as well. Uh, we're an independent research institute of the Australian government. We do work across uh, all the federal government port portfolios as well as uh, for state and territory jurisdictions and really for anyone who's prepared to commission us. <laughs> so we, most of our work is commissioned work. Uh, and um, um, I think one of the reasons I have been asked to facilitate this session, which is a great privilege, is because of um, my background in domestic violence work. Uh, one of those roles is um, I was previously the chair of the Domestic and Family Violence Council uh, for Minister Goward here in New South Wales. I'm still on the council, I'm not chair anymore, as well as a bunch of other things. So, uh, so that's me. Uh, so welcome. I'm just warning you that in this session we're moving to the dark side or the darker side of, uh, of things to discuss issues of crime including domestic violence. This, these represent some of our most entrenched social problems, wicked problems as they're often called, and these are some of the new frontiers for behavioural insights. And I was going to suggest that um, as it's the last session, last concurrent session of the two days, if like me your head is exploding by now <laughs> and you've got more questions than answers and you, you know you really want to have some more discussion about some of these burning things that uh, are searing your brain, uh, we can draw on all of those insights and questions collected over the last two days when we have our discussion today uh, because I think it's a fabulous opportunity here um, in this session to dig a little deeper into the role of behavioural insights. Uh, focusing on individual behaviour versus changing the behaviour of systems um, comes into this topic. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities of behavioural insights in influencing policy and service, services design, for example, plus many other questions that you will have. Our experts on the panel today have an enormous amount of experience and they're happy to free range on topics along with the experts uh, in the room. Uh, but firstly, I'm going to invite each of them to come up uh, separately uh, to present for about 15 minutes on the work that they have been doing. And then we'll, um, we'll gather here and uh, have, a, have a panel discussion. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to introduce to you Associate Professor Anuj Shah, and I should probably go over to his slide. There we go. Uh, he's the, as you heard this morning, the Professor of Behavioural Science at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Anuj studies the psychology that arises from facing resource scarcity. In one line of work, he studies how being short on money and time affects decision making. In another line of work, he studies how behavioural science can help shape interventions to reduce crime and violence. Uh, he's also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Ideas 42, uh, a social res science research and development lab that uses scientific insights to design innovative policies and products. Please join me in welcoming Anoush. Uh, so thanks so much for being here and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. So I'll just start us off with what one view of how we might use behavioral science to think about criminal justice policy might look like. And a lot of this is work that's been done in collaboration with the Crime Lab at the University of Chicago and with Ideas 42. And so, you know, when we think about using behavioral science as a lens into criminal justice policy, I think it's first worthwhile to step back and recognize a blind spot that exists in the current policy analysis and really the traditional economic analysis of crime. So that is, while the traditional economic analysis does a pretty good job of explaining why somebody might choose to commit a crime, it has very little at all to say about how a criminal action or an offense even enters into the mind of somebody as a possible action to choose, okay? And so to unpack a little bit about what I mean here, let's just all spend a moment thinking about a criminal action that many of us are familiar with, 
some of us might even be, be guilty of this crime, which is parking illegally, okay? <laughs> And of course, illegal parking is relatively trivial in the context of crime, but it's important because at least historically, the economic analysis of crime starts in earnest when Gary Becker is late to deliver an exam at Columbia University, and he thinks about how the only way to save time is by parking illegally. And so to simplify the story a bit, in, in Becker's mind, the criminal calculus, in his case, the decision of whether, whether or not to park illegally, really comes down to two factors, namely, what is the probability that I'll get caught doing this? And what's the cost if I get caught doing this? And, and this is actually a very simple and beautiful and intuitive model. It basically says, look, if the expected value of an action is high enough, then, then take that action. And that can describe behavior across lots of domains. And Becker suggested it describes behavior in, in the criminal justice space as well. And so once this model was formalized, or since it's been formalized, economists and sociologists, criminologists, policymakers, We've tried to use this model to reduce the number of parking tickets in the world, right? To reduce the amount of crime in the world. And when we start with this as our model, we're basically asking a question of, well, how can we make crime less attractive so that people do not choose it? And then we'll use these two levers. And this is not a foolish place to start because in the aggregate, people do respond to these two parameters. As the cost of getting caught and the likelihood of getting caught go up, crime does go down. But so here's the thing, right, which is that when you hold these two parameters constant, you still see tremendous variability in whether or not somebody commits a crime. And so there's something that this framework is missing. And I think it comes up short for a couple reasons. So namely, this is where the analysis enters in. It assumes that somebody asks themselves this explicit question of, well, should I commit this crime or not? Should I park illegally or not? And sure. You know, once that question is there in front of you, maybe you naturally do the cost benefit or expected value analysis. But here's the problem. It assumes that we face this moment of choice explicitly. But these moments of choice are rarely so explicit. These signposts don't often present themselves so obviously. Right? Maybe I'm just not well-traveled, but I've yet to come to this intersection in my life. And so this is what life looks like. You're just going along. You take some action, because in that moment, it feels necessary or it seems to make sense. And sometimes those actions happen to be offenses or crimes or otherwise they're, they're not the best actions to take. And so before I think we can apply the traditional analysis of crime to understanding behavior, we should step back and say, well, what can we actually do to create these moments of choice, to make them as explicit as the traditional analysis assumes they are? And I think that's where we behavioral scientists have some strength. We might be able to do a good job of introducing these signposts that we assume or some people assume are already there. So how do we create these signposts? How do we create these moments of choice? So these are a few principles that, that might work. These are not exhaustive, but I have a few projects that fit into these buckets, and so I'll go through them one by one. So the first thing we might do is shift people's attention so that they start to notice alternatives or actions that they might have otherwise overlooked. But also, the alternatives that come to mind depend on how we interpret a situation. And if we can get people to reconstrue the situation or question their assumptions about the situation they're in, well, then they might start to think about other alternative actions as well. And then finally, you know, we all behave differently in private than we do in public. And when we assume that we're anonymous, we might entertain certain actions that we would not entertain if we knew there was an audience. Or there are things we can do as behavioral scientists to reduce that feeling of anonymity. But let's start with this first problem, or this first possible way to create moments of choice about shifting people's attention. And so you know, one of the big problems in the criminal justice system, at least in the US, is that a lot of people don't show, show up for court. So nationally, about 20% of defendants miss their court date. And this is particularly pronounced for low-level offenses. So for example, in New York City in 2014, where we did the study, about 40% of people are missing their court date for low-level offenses. And that comes out to over 100,000 people in that year. And so, this is a problem for the criminal justice system. It, ca it can't function if people don't show up for court, but it's also a problem for the defendants themselves. Because if you skip court, you're held in contempt of court, and then a warrant for your arrest is opened. And so this low-level offense, you see what happens, it escalates into something that you could be arrested for. It might have been public consumption of alcohol, possession of a small amount of marijuana, riding your bicycle on a sidewalk in New York. You have to appear for in court if you do that. And you can see the traditional analysis baked in here, right? 
It assumes that this was intentional. That's why you're held in contempt of court. You meant to do this. And also, it assumes that if we can just make the penalties for this high enough, maybe people will stop skipping court. But as behavioral scientists, it's not hard to imagine another reason why somebody might miss court, right? They forget. They get caught up in their lives, in their work, in taking care of their kids. And this little ticket that says you have to show up for court, that recedes from attention, right? So you could call failures to appear just failures to pay attention. And there's probably at least some fraction of defendants who did not choose to skip court. They just never thought about it. And if that's the case, then we know what to do in this case, right? We remind them. We make this information more salient. And so this is work that I've done with Alyssa Fishbane at Ideas42 and Orly Oost at the University of Pennsylvania. And they really led this project. And so we did, there were two interventions with this. So first, we worked with the city of New York to redesign their summons form. So one of the problems with the old summons form is that it just said complaint. That could be about anything, right? So instead, with this new form, we make it very clear this is a criminal court appearance ticket. This ticket is about showing up to court. And then the other things we do are just simply make the information about your court date much more noticeable. We move it to the top of the ticket. So even if you barely skim this ticket, there's a higher likelihood of you encoding this information about your court date. Then the other thing that we do is course, we're behavioral scientists, we send text message reminders, right? And so we randomize people to receive different kinds of text messages. Some of the reminders uh, just warn them about the consequences. Some of them encourage them to make plans to show up for court. I'll just collapse across all those because we actually don't see much difference between the kinds of text messages. But both of these interventions were, were quite effective. So just redesigning the summons form results in a 13% decrease in failures to appear. And then when you add on the text messages for that, you also see another 26% decrease. And these are not costly. They are, these are not new interventions. They're not hard to scale. Marianne will tell us about a similar intervention in a, a higher stakes context. But I think if any, there's no real innovation here other than making a mental pivot away from assuming that this was an intentional action towards appreciating that it might have resulted from a failure to pay attention, right? And once you shift people's attention, now it can be a choice. So interventions like this or nudges like this work really well when we know exactly what behavior we're trying to change and when we know, have a good sense of the window in which to intervene. But when you're trying to discourage a criminal action, you can't be there in every single moment where somebody's entertaining that possibility. So we can't just rely on text messages. We have to also have broader, more general interventions that might get people to think more, more differently or more generally about different alternatives to entertain. And so that might look like getting them to reconstrue the situation to think about different alternatives. So let's go back to Gary Becker, that hardened criminal, right, thinking about parking illegally. And why did he do that? Well, he starts by asking himself, I'm going to be late if I park where I usually do, so how can I save time parking? So then what options come to mind for him to choose from? He says, well, I could, you know, well, maybe I, would, I could park where I usually do, and then I could just run really fast, right? That's not a real option, because we professors, we don't run. We just saunter. We saunter everywhere we go. He could say, oh, I'll make my grad student park for me. That would be an educational experience for his grad student. Or he says, I can park illegally. And once these are the options in front of him, then he can do the calculus that he said, and he can decide, think about the costs and benefits of each of these. But this is only a subset of all possible options he could have considered. And the subset only comes to mind because he puts a particular frame on his problem right now. He's got a particular perspective. How do I save time parking? But he could have just said, you know what? I'm going to be late to, I'm going to be late to class. And if that's the case, then he could have asked a different question. How do I save time on this exam? And then there are other options that come to mind entirely, right? He could say, tough luck, students. You have less time for this exam. Or he could actually choose to shorten the exam. And when he asks the question, how do I fit in the exam, notice which option does not come to mind. Parking illegally. It's irrelevant to his perspective now on the problem. And so all of this is to say that we often make assumptions about the situation that we're in, and the assumptions constrain which options come to mind. And sometimes things that seem like decisions are not decisions at all, because based on our perspective on the situation, we assume there's only really one action to take, so we take it. We didn't choose to take it. It's the only option that's there. So how does this idea actually translate into a meaningful intervention in this criminal justice space? So this is the guiding insight behind a couple of different programs that we've evaluated to reduce youth violence for young men in Chicago. And so to appreciate how you translate this insight into a program for these young men, you can take a look at the Becoming a Man program, which we've evaluated on a couple of occasions. Uh, the BAM program, which is created by Youth Guidance uh, Organization in Chicago. And so 
here's the very first exercise they do on day one of this program, and they do lots of exercises like this. So this one's called the fist. And the way the fist works is the counselor will pair up two young men. And he'll give one of the young men a rubber ball. And he says, here's what, I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a fist around this ball. The kid says, I can do that. So then he says to the other kid in the pair, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do whatever it takes for the next 60 seconds to get the ball from your partner. And by the way, there's just one rule. There are no rules. Go for it. And so you can imagine what happens, right? These are teenage young men. You tell them there are no rules. Do whatever it takes to get the ball from your partner. All hell breaks loose over the next minute, right? They're punching each other. They're scratching each other. At the end of the minute, the counselor asks, OK, what did you do to get the ball? And they come alive talking about how they physically punished their partner until they did or did not give up the ball. And then the counselor asks what we would all recognize as a ridiculous question. He says, all right, how many of you just thought to ask for the ball? No one raises their hand. No one in the history of this program has ever raised their hand. The counselor says, why not? And they say, well, if I'd asked for the ball, he would have called me a wuss. He would have MF'd me. I learned new phrases from these kids. There's no way he would have given me the ball if I just asked. The counselor says, that's an interesting assumption. Let's see if it's true. And he goes around to each of the kids who started with the ball. And he says, what would you have done if your partner just asked you for the ball? And the kids say, I would have given him the ball. I'm not a psychopath. I don't need this ball. If he had asked, I would have given it to him. Once he starts punching me, now we've got bigger problems than who, who, than who gets this ball, right? And you know, when you first watch these kids go through this exercise, it's very tempting to ask yourself, well, what is it about their personalities? What is it about their upbringing that leads them to resort to physical force in such a trivial context? Why do they choose to be violent here? They're not really making a choice, right? Instead, what they're doing is they're responding based on their assumptions, which are sometimes warranted about the situation that they're in. So to put it differently, it's not that they rejected the possibility of asking for the ball. It's that they genuinely never thought about it, because in their minds, a the situation didn't call for it. It's not that violence was the most attractive option. It's that it's the only option that really even came to mind at all. And so then over the course of 13 to 26 weeks in the BAM program, they do lots of exercises like this that are all about getting kids to question the assumptions they make about a situation, to think about other perspectives so that they can choose what they think makes the most sense. They're never told, here's what you should do. They're never told, don't fight, because in their neighborhood, sometimes they have to fight. But instead, they're tried to, they, the counselors try to teach them to be more deliberate about which assumptions they make. So we've evaluated this program on two occasions uh, with over 4,000 er, 4, people in the study. And we see that it reduces arrest for all crimes by 33%. It reduces arrest for violent crime by 50%. Another program that's based on similar insights has been done in the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center. That has a shorter time frame because these kids are just there for a shorter amount of time, but it reduces recidivism rates by as much as 20% 18 months out. So this, this is not a nudge, right? I mean, this is a bigger, more involved program, but the cost-benefit ratio is still, still off the charts for a program like this. And this is about getting them to reconstrue the situation to see other options in front of them. So just briefly, the last thing that I'll mention is reducing the sense that we that we're anonymous, that nobody's paying attention, right? So one reason why crimes might proceed is because people think that nobody's actually watching. And this is why billions of dollars are spent on surveillance. But is there another way to increase the sense, the feeling that there is an actual audience for our actions? And so we did some focus groups with prior offenders in New York City. And one question that we asked them was, look, there's probably times you thought about going forward with an offense, but you didn't do it. Why not? And one response that came up time and again was that, these guys would say, well, I thought about going forward with this thing, but there's one particular police officer I know in my neighborhood. And I just felt like if I did this thing, he would know what I was up to. And you know, as we, over the course of these conversations, what we find is that these guys are tapping into a well-known psychology called the illusion of transparency, where we assume that other people know more about what's going on in our minds than they actually do. And what they're suggesting is that one thing that increases the illusion of transparency is when I know more about somebody else, I assume that person knows more about me. Because that's usually true in our relationships. We tend to have a symmetrical relationship where we know the same amount about each other. They're suggesting when I know more about somebody else, I think they know more about me. So just very quickly, we've tested this in the lab and we're now rolling out an intervention in the field in New York. But here's what this looks like in the lab. So we tell people you're going to participate with somebody else online. That's a lie. They're not actually participating with somebody else online. We simulate the interaction. We have participants write down four things that are true about themselves and one lie. And we say, your partner is going to try to guess which of your statements is a lie. How likely do you think they are to guess accurately which of your statements is a lie? So think of this as a measure of how much you feel like your partner actually knows about you. And then we tell them things about their partner or we don't. 
And so we, these things that we tell them about their partners are totally mundane facts that are not diagnostic about being a smart person at all. Things like I drive a Toyota, I have a dog, I grew up in the US, I like watching TV. They don't actually tell you anything about how smart the other person is. But what's interesting is that when people have more facts about their partner, they think their partner is going to be better at detecting which of their statements is a lie. They think their partner knows more about them simply because they know more about their partner. And in other lab experiments, we find that this has a deterrent effect. So when you know more about the person whose job it is to catch dishonest behavior, you're less likely to engage in that behavior as well. So what does this look like in the field? So we've been working with the New York City Police Department. Uh, they have these community police officers who we asked to fill out various questionnaires. We use their answers on these questionnaires to create business cards for these officers that don't look like the traditional police uh, per officer's business cards. They have factoids like Wonder Woman's my favorite superhero, the Jets are my favorite sports team for some reason. And so then we've randomized different housing developments to either receive these business cards or not from their neighborhood officers. That part's done, and now we're tracking whether or not this changes the feeling that the officers know more about what's going on in the community, and will that, in fact, deter low-level crime vandalism. So BX 2019 will have those results, or, or null results, we'll see. So let me, let me wrap up, because I'm actually over. So basically, what I'm hoping to leave you with is, a, is the view that you know, these explicit moments of choice don't always exist. And I've suggested three possible ways to make them more explicit, but there's, there's lots of other ways that we can brainstorm about as well. So I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks very much, Anuj. So now, I can't, I'm so short I can't see you. I've actually got a, a mic, I'm mic'd up, so I don't need to stand behind that really tall thing. Um, so now I'd like to introduce you to Marianne O'Loughlin AM, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy of the Department of Premier and Cabinet in New South Wales. Mary Ann uh, has responsibility for advising on justice, health, family and community services and education. She joined the New South Wales Government from KPMG where she was an Executive Director in Management Consulting. Previously she held a number of senior executive positions in the Commonwealth Public Service and was Senior Advisor Social Policy to Prime Minister Paul Keating. In 2013, she was appointed a member of the Order of Australia for Significant Service to Public Administration and Social Policy. Uh, please welcome Mary Ann. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ann. And hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I really um, enjoyed that presentation. You'll see um, that we didn't um, actually check our homework together, but we <laughs> haven't had have a number of. Um, commonalities, which I think is really reinforcing. Now I have to do something, um, so bear with me. One's a little bit more complicated than the other one. Okay, control L. Okay, watch everybody. This is <laughs> going to work. Well done. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the work of the New South Wales Behavioural Insights Unit, which was established in 2012. It was the first in Australia, so don't even think about BETA. They weren't even in conception. <laughs> we have a multidisciplinary, not that we're competitive now, we have a multidisciplinary team of 13 people. Many of these delightful people are here today, I'm thrilled to say, because when Anne opens it up to those broader questions, she's threatened to, don't look at me. They're here, they've got the answers. We work across the New South Wales government, health, transport, education, environment. And we started applying behavioural insights in simple ways, like changing the way government communicates to encourage paying taxes and fines. And we've shifted to more complex social problems, like returning to work faster, tackling childhood obesity. But since 2014, what I want to talk to you about is the work we've been doing on reducing the incidence of domestic violence which is a very complex problem. Do you think the clicker works for this one? Okay. Excellent, thanks. So why focus on domestic violence? Um, we know it's a really common, tragic comedy, um, sorry, crime in, in New South Wales, as in Australia and, and worldwide. Um, and due to a reluctance of victims to report offenders, we don't actually know its true prevalence, but what we do know 
is in New South Wales in 2017, 30 people died because of domestic violence, which is 40% of total homicides. The New South Wales government has a target to reduce domestic violence reoffending by 25% by 2021. And it's one of our Premier's personal 12 priorities that she identified. Now, there are many ways that the government has programs to target the and change the behaviour of per per perpetrators um, and run by our Department of Justice, our Department of Family and Community Services. And most of these programs are built upon fairly traditional approaches to changing behaviour. But what we do in Behavioural Insights, I'm going to move you out of the way. Is, there's a different proposition. Instead of trying to change people's behaviour and by, by, by changing their thinking, so relying on people actively becoming aware of the need to change their behaviour and to decide and to commit to it, Pavel Insights focuses on the intended or desired behaviour and encourages people to demonstrate it. So I'm going to take you through some examples of how we're working to do this in the area of domestic violence. Our work's based around increasing compliance with what in New South Wales is called an Apprehended Domestic Violence Order, or ADVO. It's often called a restraining order in other jurisdictions. The ADVO puts strict conditions on how and where a defendant can contact a victim. For many victims, ADVOs are really effective in reducing behaviours such as physical assault, stalking, verbal abuse, intimidation. However, breaches are very common. So our, BIS, our, our Behavioural Insights Unit commenced this work by undertaking extensive field work to understand the issues and identify the behaviours needed to shift compliance. Asking a simple question, what does complying with an ADVO look like? From there we built a series of behaviourally informed initiatives with better understanding, engagement and then compliance with ADVOs using more complex interventions. Our goal is to find behavioural insights interventions that work and can be built to scale. So to take you through our steps along this way, the first thing we did before was to tackle the ADVO itself. And this is very similar to the work we've just heard from. We can't expect offenders to actually comply with an order unless they understand what we're asking them to do. So the first was actually just to, to translate it into plain English. And we rolled that out in all courts in 2016 that the police and our frontline workers told us that the language in the orders was too legalistic, difficult to understand. The readability test we did on the original ADVO showed that to understand it, the reader needed to have completed 13 and a half years of education or the equivalent of university study. So how did we change it? First, we simplified the language, removed complicated misleading terms and replaced them with language that's more direct and relatable. Now, in terms of the readability tests, the revised ADVO requires only eight years of education or the equivalent of early high school. We also personalised the messaging to make the orders more salient, removed the use of third person in direct language to encourage greater accountability. We put right up front, this is very similar to what Anouj did, right up front the consequences of breaching the orders that had previously been buried at the end. You can see this from the example on the slide. It says, Gary Smith, you must follow the orders set out below. If you don't, this is a criminal offence called a breach. If you breach, you could be arrested by the police. You could go to prison for two years and be fined $5,500. We also added examples to explain what the orders meant in practice. For example, no contact means you can't contact the person at all, not through text messages, emails, Facebook or social media. Finally, we drew upon social norms to challenge the normalisation of violence, which is prevalent among some cohorts. One court, court worker, worker told us that some depend, defendants say, I only gave her a black eye, as it's viewed to be only a minor act of violence relative to more serious incidents. So we included messages to counter this, such as, most relationships do not include fear, control or violence. You are now a minority of people who has one of these orders. We also took account of our um, behavioural insights field work, which found that highlighting the impact on children had a positive impact on some offenders. When the field work was taken, 
we found out that they actually didn't really care about the victim. So saying something about the victim didn't help, but some of them cared a hell of a lot about their children. So we added this message to the ADVO. When children are exposed to violence in a home, they are much more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety and aggression, and they do worse at school. And putting it all together, that's um, an example of the current plain English ADVO. The second thing we did was informed by data showing that about 25% of offenders don't show up in court, similar again to what we heard about Anusha's interventions. Our field work showed that this caused stress and anxiety for victims. They didn't know why they did, the defendant didn't turn up, they didn't know whether they were after them again, whether they were, you know, uh, had understood the ADVO. It also impacts on police and court resources through extra paperwork and extra time chasing defendants. So we used reminders, similar to the other example, to boost court attendance by DV perpetrators. We had a randomised control trial in five courts, and the intervention was a timely personalised reminder sent via text to defendants the day before the court appointment. So the trial worked. The SMS reminder produced a significant increase in court attendance. Defendants who received the SMS prior to their court appearance were on average four percentage points more likely to attend their court appearance or 23% in relative percentage terms. And of course that include um, improved court efficiency. So and the results are good news and I'm pleased to announce that last week the New South Wales government allocated funding in our budget to scale up the trial's successful intervention. The third intervention to talk about is called What's Your Plan? So we build upon these simpler nudges to follow this up with a more complex intervention. The What's Your Plan is a planning tool for Aboriginal defendants. It involves a one-on-one -on -one meeting with defendants with an Aboriginal support worker immediately after the defendant's first ADVO, ADVO court hearing. In this meeting, they make a plan for how they comply with their ADVO. So it, the tool relies on um, behavioural tools. It has a tool and a discussion with the caseworker and during this, we prompt defendants to reflect on the impact that the ADO restrictions will have on them and the steps they'll take to make sure they don't breach the order. Because you get an ADVO and it can say a lot of things and you walk out and it's, you know, it's still quite complicated. So to actually say to people, okay, you've got an ADVO and it says, for example, it could say something, if you've been drinking, you cannot go home. You cannot go within, you know, X hundred metres of home. So you can't go home. What are you going to do? And we do if-then plans to help them develop a plan to work through the obstacles that might prevent them from complying. So we could say, okay, what, what are you going to do if you go and have a drink because you can't go home? And they go, okay, well, when do you have a drink? Well, maybe it's Friday night after work. Well, what would you do then? Well, often I you know, drink with Barney. I could go and stay with Barney's place and sleep with Barney's house and then, you know, get over my drinking. So they've got a practical way of working through an ADVO. So here's some examples some of a real what's your plan. Um, so you can see that they're being asked very simply what's your goal, what's the motivation to keep to the goal, and an if-then plan. We encourage defenders also to compose a text message themselves that they could have sent to themselves at regular intervals to reinforce their plan. For example, one said, my family come first and doing everything right might help me get happier and get my family back. So if then planning is based on mental contrasting and implementation intentions, and we think this might be the first use of its kind in the world. And it's very different from the first two, which was the plain English ADVO and the SMS trials. This time we're going bottom up, working with individuals rather than top down, changing the system. And this can be much harder because we know people tend to operate in system one thinking, automatic, fast, emotional. In what's your plan, we're trying to nudge people to say, System two thinking terms, slower, more deliberate, calmer approach to the problems. We don't have results yet, but the anecdotal e evidence is very compelling about the effectiveness and value of what you plan. Actually, particularly from the Aboriginal court workers who witness the change and feel that they've got a tool to help the defendants. One senior court worker spoke of the benefits of being that the defendants see themselves, they actually can be part of a solution, not just a problem for everyone. For many of these Aboriginal defendants, it's the first time that anyone has asked them what their goals are or shown belief in their capacity to change and break out of the cycle of violence. And you can see from these examples 
the, how the offenders are engaging with the process. The fourth measure that we're taking is a digital app. And we've, we've, now we're focusing on um, individuals, I said, in what's your plan, rather than system change. But we realise to deliver these interventions at scale, we need another platform. We've been told by New South Wales Police and stakeholders that while there are many digital apps for victims, there are none that focus on the perpetrator to change their behaviour. So we partnered with Avow and the Department of Finance, Services and Innovation to develop and incubate a groundbreaking mobile phone app to help defendants comply with their ADVOs. The app builds upon our previous trials. There's court reminders, plain English information and an if-then planning con conversation, as well as behavioural insights um, built as well into the app. So we try to test the efficacy of this on behaviour change. But first of all, we need to see if people actually download it and use it. So the first thing we're doing is launching an implementation pilot to test this in two weeks. I just want to finish by reflecting on some of the, the key messages I take from the work with Behavioural Insights team, because my point is I'm actually a policy person. I'm not a member of the Behavioural Insights team. I'm just lucky enough to work with them. But I have worked in social policy for 30 years, and in some important areas, it's a career of failure. And I say that sincerely. During my career, not only have heartbreaking problems such as domestic violence not improved, but they've actually worsened. For someone whose career is about social policy, this is extremely confronting. It's a very hard life to live, where in these entrenched problems, we're not making any progress. So I'm really interested in what behavioural insights can bring to policy and how we can use it to tackle those problems. And for me, as a policy person, I think of behavioural insights as offering me both a mindset and a method. The mindset draws upon social and cognitive psychology. And I love the fact it urges us to be clear about the behaviour we're trying to change. Be specific about it. What behaviour do you want to encourage or discourage? If you want a different outcome, someone has to do something different. And that's what Make a Plan's about. It's about identifying and changing specific behaviour, like where are you going to sleep at night when you get drunk? Because you can't go home. What are you going to do? This is very different, to be frank, to the numerous high-level policy strategies with 94, 163, 254 initiatives that I have been involved with in my career, just sprayed across the world hoping something works. The method of behavioural sciences matches the mindset for me. Rather than attempting to solve problems with these large, expensive, long-term programs and strategies, we aim to change behaviour with small interventions. It's the power of small change that we hear about. Small-scale interventions can often create, as we know, the big differences leading to cascading changes in behaviour over time. Therefore, start small and iterate. If possible, use randomised control trials to see what the impact of the intervention is happening. We did this with the SMS trial I spoke about earlier, where we reminded people to turn up to court the day before. I said the results showed that this was effective. But really interesting, it was less effective for Aboriginal defendants. Now, from consultation with our Aboriginal service partners, one possible reason they gave is the language was quite commanding. And furthermore, the message came from police. So those things might have been things that actually put them off. And rather than encourage them to attend, it discouraged them attending. But we can only speculate until we hope to test that in a subsequent iteration. So that's a great example of the methodology of BI in practice about testing, learning and adapting. Now, domestic violence is a scourge. It's a scourge to victims. It's a scourge to their families, particularly to their children and to our communities. And I'm just so heartened and promised by being able to work with a new tool, such as Behavioural Insights, to hope we can tackle it better. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. I think many of us share your <laughs> despair of uh, many failures throughout our careers, and uh, we're also looking for solutions Oh, control W. Beautiful, thank you. 
Okay, now it's David. David. David Yoakum, who some of you um, have seen speak earlier today, is the director of the lab at DC, which is in the executive office of the mayor. David uh, was previously a founding member of the White House's social and behavioral sciences team and director of its scientific delivery unit housed at the US General Services Administration. David's expertise draws on the cognitive foundations of judgment and decision making, and in particular, how that knowledge and associated methodologies can be extended into applied settings. So please welcome David. So I was going to open with good day mates, but <laughs> Ashley informed me that's a little bit more stereotypical than actually said. So I'll just say, howdy y'all, how's everybody doing? I got in from Washington DC on Sunday at about 9 a.m. after traveling for several thousand hours, but did not go to sleep. I hit the streets immediately and have been visiting lovely Sydney. One of the things that I did is I visited the Hyde Park barracks. So one of the early prisons. And if you go in there, up on the top floor, they have recreated the hammocks that prisoners would actually sit in. And you can sit in it, or lay in it, rather. And I laid in it, and I fell asleep <laughs> for about an hour or so. But I would like to think this is really doing the method actor sort of preparation to be able to talk about criminal justice. So I, you know, very Daniel Day Lewis of conferences. Uh, I, I am the director of the lab at DC, and if you haven't heard of this, we're based out of the executive office of the mayor in the District of Columbia. We do everything from designing and evaluating new ways of subsidizing uh, housing vouchers to try to increase housing stability to you know, stitching together administrative data to build algorithms that predict where rats are most likely to be in the city and kind of everything in between. And also spend a tremendous amount of time, not only on the projects on the left hand, but on the right hand, trying to think about how can we change the bureaucracy itself to facilitate this type of work, to sink it into the budget cycle, to change how we do contracts and procurement, to change how we do hiring. Because if we really want a government that's capable of generating evidence, I think there are some things we need to change to the structure of our institutions directly. Today, I'm going to tell you about one of our first trials that we have results on that made a bit of a splash. It's with our Metropolitan Police Department, and it's on the issue of body-worn cameras. And this is a technology that has been rapidly spreading over the last five or so years. In the United States, it's certainly coming from a context of a very troubled history between police officers and residents, a lot of racial dynamics to it, and lots of calls coming from people across a lot of different spectrums to try to do something about a perceived problem of overuse of force by officers in particular. And body-worn cameras were one of the technological solutions that a lot of hopes have been kind of hung on. And it's based on some pretty sound theory. You know, we know from some classic social psychology research that when people are being observed, they tend to sometimes change their behavior, Hawthorne effect type things. And it's been shown to increase charitable giving, all kinds of different places. And so whenever people are thinking about body-worn cameras outfitted on officers, I tend to think of three kind of buckets of hope for benefits. One of them is the actual interaction on the street between officers and residents and a hope for behavior change that happens. So this is really tapping into that Hawthorne effect sort of dynamic with the hope that from both sides, officers will be most likely to use force, but also residents will be less likely to do things that perhaps prompt the need to use force. But all around, both parties would have kind of a, a chilling effect that happens so that the likelihood that force is used or some sort of a complaint emerges is reduced. A second one is the potential evidentiary value of the video footage itself. This is a new record that could be introduced in trying to resolve complaints and pursuing cases. Will the video footage actually be useful in that way? And then a the third one, and I think it's also kind of reflects if those first two things are happening well, was a hope that the overall perceived legitimacy of the criminal justice system would be improved. And in criminal justice systems, legitimacy matters a lot. Like We actually rely on people to sort of self-regulate behavior far, far more than we want to actually be enforcing proper behavior. And so if you start to have a breakdown in that, lots of problems and kind of emerge. The amazing thing is that despite the true, really very large cost of body-worn cameras and the tremendous privacy implications of having increased surveillance, the, the sort of reality of whether these effects would occur weren't really known. 
And so in the district, we made a very conscious effort to say that when we're going to roll out these cameras based on the theory that we have, we don't want to stop there. We actually want to roll it out in a way that we can evaluate as rigorously as we can the impact it's having. Are those hoped for benefits actually occurring? And so in June of 2015, what we started to do when cameras were being deployed across officers is we randomized. Flip a coin. If it's a heads, you get a camera as an officer. If it's a tails, you don't. And we did this with the entire active police force that's out on the street. So this is actually the largest RCT on this issue in the world by several orders of magnitude, actually. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the District of Columbia, well, one, we're the capital, you probably know that, but the, off, the sort of geographic area, it's about 70 square miles. We have a population of about 700,000 people. It doubles in size whenever the commuters come in from surrounding states. And it's a pretty dense kind of metropolitan, metropolitan area. And the randomization introducing it was sort of logistically complicated to get everyone to buy in to doing this, but relative to the cost of the program overall, the cost of introducing randomization wasn't very much. And we also relied on a lot of existing administrative data to track on outcomes. And so they were already collecting information about whether uses of force occurred, already tracking information about whether complaints were registered, and we know things about how complaints are being resolved and how likely a case is to be prosecuted down the world, down, sort of downstream with the court systems. And so overall, very complicated to do this. It took a very long time. If we want to do a QA and a a little bit about what it takes to get embedded in a police department, I'm happy to do that. But the main point here is that relative to the overall cost, because we were positioned to sort of weave in the evaluation from the onset, the marginal cost was actually quite small, I think. And so this rolls out. I'm going to make one little sidebar just on process, which is that try to pay a lot of attention to doing the study in a way that was going to be trusted in the community, right? So after all, this is a place where there's already a lot of trust issues, and so you might worry when the study comes out, depending on the result, people might like or dislike the study more or less. So pull off your psychology on motivated reasoning, this is an issue. And what we did is we used a pre-analysis plan, which is a document, as the name suggests, where you actually write out in advance of having your final data really sort of detailed description of the methodology you're going to use, the statistical tools that you're going to use, it's actually setting and you know, writing down the equation that you're going to use to determine whether there's a difference between these two groups. And pre-analysis plans really started to emerge in the last few years as a way of reducing kind of data analytic discretion. So there's been research showing that once you're in the data, you have a lot of choices you can make around, you know, does this row look weird? Do I need to delete it? Do I log transform or not? And what's been shown is that consciously or unconsciously, if you know what you're looking for, data analysts will make those decisions in a biased way that's more likely to increase that they get the conclusion that they want. So kind of a little bit of a thumb on the scale. And the pre-analysis plan from a research integrity standpoint helps because you make those decisions without actually knowing what your thumb is doing on the scale at all. You have to make those decisions based on the merits of what you know today, not on how it might influence what happens tomorrow. But the pivot point here is that we've been trying a lot in the district to sort of think about how we can use something like a pre-analysis plan for political purposes as well to increase the buy-in. And so in the build-up to the study, actually did about 10 or so different community events going out and talking about the pre-analysis plan with police officers, with also police complaints, with college students, with high school students, with the ACLU and Black Lives Matters, with just everyday residents actually explaining in a lot of detail. Some of these sessions were two, three hours. Here is how we're actually going to do this. Here's what we're thinking about measuring. Are these the right questions? Is this enough power? Like those places where it's a fundamental value judgment, what should we be doing? What's a meaningful effect size? How certain do we need to be? We as scientists shouldn't be doing that. We should be getting input from the community about how they think about these values. And the pre-analysis plan is a document that we were able to do that. And I'll tell you that once we had the results, we also went back out in the community, did another 10 or so, talking about the results, answering questions about it, and trying to facilitate a discussion about what it means for our community. So flash forward, here's the results. And that pre-analysis plan, by the way, you can, you, can, you can go get it. We publicly registered in a way that's timestamped. We can never touch it. If you go to our website, thelab.dc, Gov. You can find that project and lots of other ones. Here's the results, though. And the way I want you to imagine this is imagining a 1,000 officers over the course of the year. I'm going to tell you the difference between a 1,000 officers over the course of a year who have cameras and a 1,000 officers over the course of a year who do not have cameras. And remember, coin flip randomization, so you'd expect these to be the same on average unless the one thing we've controlled to be different, namely the cameras, causes a difference. With users of force, we see a very, very small difference, but one that is indistinguishable from the noise you would just expect by chance. More specifically, the group of 1,000 officers over years that have cameras had about 74 more uses of force than that group of 1,000 that didn't. 
But the confidence intervals here span from negative about 100 to positive 250, right? So a statistically insignificant or null result. Flash to complaints, a similar story. Very, very, very small difference, about 54 more complaints amongst those 1,000 officers over a year with cameras relative to those who didn't. But a confidence interval spanning from about negative 25 to 150 or so. So another statistically insignificant or null result. Likelihood of being prosecuted, the way complaints are being resolved. All the other things that we said we were going to report on, which we do, a similar sort of cascading story of no results, of not seeing any differences that we would sort of confidently ex think is different than what we expect from just random noise. Now, I want to say something about interpreting the null here. And if you read the paper that we have on this, it's actually a somewhat unique paper in that the vast majority of it is all about what nulls mean and what they don't mean. And so here's a couple of things. One, really there may be no effective body-worn cameras on these things. This is the most sort of obvious interpretation of this, and this is certainly a likelihood. And for those who've had strong expectations of seeing a large kind of average shift in something like uses of force or complaints, this study should cause you to change your posterior probability estimates of that. You should think it is less likely now that's going to happen. But a null could also sort of mask a small effect. So those little numbers I was saying of the differences, we can't distinguish from noise. And this is, as I mentioned, the largest powered study by quite a, by quite a lot. But we can't rule out that the cameras had some sort of really powerful dispositive usefulness on one or two or three cases or four cases or something like that, anything within there. And to my mind, this is a, this is a perfectly uh, legitimate point, but I think where this has sort of shifted the conversation with police chiefs across the United States and internationally, of whom I've talked to lots now, that is a slightly different reason and justification for why you might want the program. And one of the things that's happening right now is that the expectations for those large average shifts, people aren't expecting that so much, and the conversation is shifting a bit to, all right, well, maybe it helps in a few one-off cases. Is it worth it? And I don't know the answer to that, but that is pushing the policy discussion in a forward direction, where if we want to have cameras and all of their cost and privacy implications for that use, fine. The study has done a great thing pushing it that way. A third one is that DC might just be unique. And so this is where issues of generalizability of effects across jurisdictions come in. And DC is unique. It's the capital of the United States. Our police force, as a result of that, has some unique trainings to be able to deal with the president being there with capital protests. We have a unique history of a amount of reform over the last 20 years in the department. And so if you're coming from a different sort of jurisdiction with a different population and crime mecca, a different history of training, maybe the cameras will have an effect in that space. But again, here I would say that's certainly a possibility, but the probability of that should go down a little bit in this, right? The fact that there can be differences across jurisdictions doesn't mean you get to just ignore the evidence that comes from one of the other ones. It just might change how you weight it in thinking about how it would apply in your situation. The fourth one is that we could have issues of spillover here, by which I mean we're not comparing a world in the district where everybody has cameras versus one where everybody doesn't. Practically speaking, there are officers out on the street with cameras or not. And the fact that I'm an officer who is assigned to the control condition that can see an officer from the treatment condition, that might impact my behavior because I know that the cameras are out there. One thing we did is we tried to isolate the analysis, and this was pre-registered in our analysis plan, by the way, was to look at situations where at the scene we knew there were officers, none of whom had a camera, situations where all of them had a camera, or places where they were mixed. And the effects are the same across all three. So we can't rule out spillover, but to the extent we can get a window into that from this data, we don't have any evidence of it as the sort of explanation for this. And the last thing I would say is that there could still be effects outside the administrative data of what we were relying on to measure here. And there are, of course, things that we didn't actually measure at all. So there could be behaviors that were improper that were never being documented in the administrative data that now aren't happening, but we won't see that because we're constricted to the administrative data. We also didn't do a particularly important sort of data collection just because we didn't have the resources to do it, but to do polling on this legitimacy question, that third bucket. There could be legitimacy benefits that we're just not able to tap into this study because we've had to because of resource constraints to focus on slightly different things. But there again, if you're shifting the debate to thinking about that as a possible benefit, that's fine. We could think about that. We could think about how studies to do it as well. The one other just a little fun fact I'll give you. So the amount of departments that I've talked to and, and sort of outlets that we've done, I do have one favorite that I've done at this point. It was a radio interview in Canada with one of those morning 
shows with like lots of sound effects and like, bow, 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 bow. good morning, Toronto. We're joined today by Dr. Yoakum talking about body cams. And it was like, it was like a 60 second bit. But the, the more serious point here is that I, I, I would like to think that some of the, the storytelling around this, the attention to being able to talk about confidence intervals and things like that to a very diverse audience is one that we can set as a standard for ourselves. And I can tell you that internal in the department, I had a lot of arguments with our, our press team. They're like, you can't talk about this kind of stuff. Nobody's actually going to want to talk about this. And we did it anyway. Then through a lot of those community events I was talking about, the one slide I was going to show was our, the website that we have, which is just bwc.thelab.dc.gov. Thelab.dc.gov is the main website. But there, again, there's a lot of attention to sort of a very accessible lay description of the study. But we didn't shy away from having confidence intervals and effect sizes. And it's working. And, and actually, one of the, some of my favorite emails I've gotten from residents have been along the lines of, hey, I just wanted to say thanks for actually taking the time to talk about the technical nuances and not think that we're just a bunch of idiots. And so I think there's something about the process here and, and going out of our way to talk about it that can be a key part of elevating the discussion of evidence, not only on this study, but in studies overall. Uh, so I think I'll leave it there, but I'll just say, if you want to learn more about this project and other ones, you know the website, the lab. <laughs> .dc.gov. We also have a podcast and other things that you can connect with. Thank you. Stay there. Well, thank you to all our panelists for their uh, very frank and fearless accounts of uh, the interesting work that you've been doing. And I might just um, launch into the discussion by staying with you, David, just for a minute, because it's, you know, you were the last one. Um, it's, it sounds like um, the transparency of the thing was an important piece and the engagement with the community. But I did have one question about um, how, what, what was the branding in the sense of how well did the community that you were trying to um, influence in terms of crime know that the cameras were being worn. How well known was that? Was there advertising of that? I mean, can you talk a bit about that? Well, so there was a lot of public push and discussion about outfitting officers with cameras. As I mentioned, the, the actual call for this was an uprising from residents for the most part, not from political actors or police departments pushing for them one way or another, except mm -hmm. in response to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of awareness in that sense. Mm -hmm. Another layer of this question, though, is in the sort of heat of interactions, do people notice the cameras? And I think here is where, just to go back to the psychology of how this intervention. Can you describe so, it? So what oh, yeah, yeah. Like? So there's different ones. In the district, there are, there are little squares that you wear here. They do have cameras that are, are glasses. They're becoming less rare just because um, they cause problems for officers. It's actually a very interesting sidebar of just trying to, how to make decisions on how to get the equipment on officers in a way that doesn't cause injuries and breaks. We actually spent several months just piloting that. It's not a trivial mm -hmm. thing. And they already have like a lot of you know, Batman belts of stuff on them. Mm -hmm. um, but the psychology of what we're expecting cameras to do, I mean, it is asking a lot. And if you think about these interactions where you know, emotions are running high, maybe somebody's under the influence of alcohol or mm. drugs, the prospects that they will both notice the cameras, mm. care about it, and then modulate mm. their behavior mm -hmm. is asking a lot. And I mean, mm -hmm. after all, I mean, think of some of the horrific YouTube videos you've seen where people are doing crazy things and all around them are like 15 people with cameras like this. And you're like, how, how are you doing it on camera? It's like, yeah. well, they probably don't notice it or pay attention or are able to modulate. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, a question to all of you, because uh, in, in some ways each of your examples uh, were kind of novel. They were novel uh, inventions, uh, and, uh, and I imagine that you had some challenges convincing the relevant authorities, the, the, uh, the, the broader structures that you work within to even try it out. Can you reflect a bit on how you dealt with some of those challenges in even getting trials of these things up and running? something that he said it took him 24 hours to learn. It took me about a month to learn, uh, which was instead of going in to, say, a police department like New York Police Department and saying, well, here's how behavioral science looks and here's the way that it can be used, to just start with, well, what's the problem that you're focused on and that you're working, that you're trying to fix? And so that's why, you know, mm. there they were concerned a lot, I think genuinely, about rebuilding uh, the community police relationships. And so then we say, okay, 
these neighborhood coordination officers, what are some of the barriers that you think are there for them actually rebuilding the relationships? And so that's where the conversation starts about, well, let's talk about how this is gonna fix your problem and then we'll work out the behavioral science from there. Mm -hmm. So sense. start from where they're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I think the thing, the thing I'm gonna focus on is um, the what's your plan because I find it the most um, interesting of all of them. And it's very, very community based. I mean, it's really, really local. Mm. And there it was um, the challenge of getting acceptance by the court and the court workers. Now we're lucky enough in this very room to have the person who's responsible for this trial. And this is Eva. And so if you don't mind, I'm actually going to ask Eva the question because she will know the right answer to how hard it was, Eva, to get the, the different courts and the court workers to embrace what's your plan for Aboriginal defendants. Would you like to stand up, Eva, so the cameraman can see? <laughs> I told her I was going to do it, so <laughs> it's not my fault. I wasn't expecting yeah. it, was I? Um, yeah, look, it was um, a, a challenge to some extent. Uh, when we went sort of originally, we, we did we did code. We, we were anticipating, and a lot with all our projects, we we don't just kind of come in and surprise people. You know, it's a co-design process. We work together from the and even with the development of the actual plan itself, it was, um, you know, with heavy input from the frontline staff. But when we were kind of, particularly when we were going around and sort of training all the staff members, we had, um, you know, people say things like, look, I don't think this is going to work for my people. Um, you know, this is a bit sort of, you know, probably a bit, a bit kind of the sort of more soft stuff. Probably, so, and for a lot of these workers as well, while they are trained in engagement, um, they're not case workers. So this was, you know, probably, a, you know, it was a little bit of a stretch for them. But um, what we've been finding is, as you know, they've been actually going out and and um, and doing it, and and seeing the way that res the defendants are responding mm. to it, and not being um, the way they expected it to be. You know, being a lot more positive and receptive than what they expected. Um, there, you know, we've had people that you know some of the most cynical ones, and I should say they were in the minority anyway. But the ones that were perhaps more cynical actually sort of come around and say, you know, this is amazing, and now they're some of the biggest champions of um, of, of the program. So. So that's actually been, um, you know, quite you know, encouraging. So it was a co-design process with the court workers. Did you go out, or have you had any feedback from the general community? Uh, no, we, we try very hard to sort of keep the, the trial under wraps, <laughs> just because um, oh, okay. we don't want to publicise it too well. much. We've, we've, made, we've made some public statements about it, but not, not mm. sort of into too much detail. Um, I think we've had, um, you know, from internal stakeholders within Justice, we've had a lot of... Department of Justice, um, who've been our partners, that you know, we've had a lot of um, positive feedback, not just from you know the um, policymakers, but from other frontline staff that are at at the courts. Maybe not delivering the intervention, but you know, seeing that um, you know that they like the fact that they've got something that they can refer people to. And so we've mm -hmm. been generally getting you know really good feedback from mm -hmm. um, service providers. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Eva. David, do you want to comment on that question about the? Um well, you, you described a bit the consultations that you held and so on, but still your um, political masters would have had to have um, bought into it. How did you get them over the line? The political masters? So, <laughs> uh, so to the tremendous credit of our political... So our, our mayor, Muriel Bowser, our chief of police, originally Kathy Lanier and now Peter Newsham, they, they really wanted to know whether it works. And I think a starting point at a high level of really caring about what works is a useful enabling condition to be operating in. Mm. But that still leaves a lot of issues to be sorted through in the design and implementation, like actually taking that high level desire to know what works and, and implement it. And you know, you know, concretely in this case, it was things like a lot of political pressure to get cameras on all officers as fast as possible. Yep. That was intention with the need for a control group. Yep. And so a big part of this project was not only sort of saying, well, this is, the, this is how much power I want as a scientist, like, do it. Um, we actually did a lot, you know, and personally did a lot of conversations with a lot of people around the value of it, explaining what a control group would do, the expense of if we get it out super, super fast, but wouldn't be able to say anything about how it worked. And so as a scientist, being willing to get in the political trenches, so to speak, to have those conversations was a key part of increasing the likelihood it happens, but also just building trust with the department of like, hey, here's a guy that actually is, is in it with us and understands what it takes to sort of grind out on a, on a project. Yeah. And, and actually, if I may, 
one of my favorite moments of this. So the, our mayor, Mary Bowser, she was on Morning Joe, which in the U.S. is like a morning show with, I guess, Joe. And, and, <laughs> and it's, it, it's one of those sort of, quick, those sort of quick ones. And Joe came out with a sort of aggressive question on like, well, why don't all of the cameras, or why don't all the officers have cameras? And Mayor Bowser, without skipping me, is like, oh, well, we have to have a control group or else we won't know whether it works. <laughs> and, and like, yeah, and Joe was like, oh, oh. And it like just completely, it just completely shut it down in a way that yeah. I like that moment because I think it reveals what is possible if, if everyone really kind of understands what we're doing here. There's a political way to talk about this that's very compelling as well. And I think with our trial as well, I think similarly because people really liked using the tool, this is what I heard from the team, we came under a lot of pressures that the Aboriginal support workers really liked having something mm. to give the defendants and to work mm. with them that there was pressure to say, let's just do it for everybody. Like, we love this. Like, the, let's just roll it out. Yeah, yeah. And to be able to say, well, no, actually, then I know, you, you know, the, it's, it's a good tool and you're enjoying it, but we have to know, does it actually reduce re-offending? And that's, the, mm. that's our target measure. Mm. Um, so you've got to hold the line. It's hard. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. OK, I might throw to you guys for a minute. I've got heaps of questions here, but let's hear what you've got to ask. Yes. Could you stand up, please? Thank you. And just perhaps say where you're from. My name's Hal Willoughby uh, with Colossum Consulting and the uh, University of Sydney. Uh, my question goes to one of both the process as well as the evaluation of making an intervention. So intervention, process design. Um, and I'll just... I'll get to my question in a second, but a quick observation. So today, you've all talked about, I think, interventions which have, in a sense, a mechanism. So you've explicated how they are meant to work. And in your case, David, you've said, you know, there's sort of three buckets and, um, and I won't go into the detail, but all of you have to some extent said that. And I contrast that with some of the uh, other pr presentations we've seen, and I'm not being critical, but for example, um, sending out a letter to GPs that says you're prescribing of anti uh, antibiotics is this and your peers is this. So there's a kind of social norm intervention. And in those sorts of interventions, it, does, it seems to me there's no, um, there's no explicit or formal statement of the way in which that works. So it, maybe it's competition or maybe it's benchmarking or maybe it's just feedback on their own prescribing. They didn't know. We don't know how it works. We know that it works if there's a significant outcome. My question. Um, to what extent do you think that the mediating mechanisms could, should, and are uh, explicitly incorporated in the design of an intervention and its evaluation? So thinking about you know, Barron and Kinney and mediation analyses and that sort of thing. I'm sorry, I'm happy, to uh, yeah. happy, happy to start. <laughs> You know, maybe I'll use the, the BAM study as an example because there, you know, I, I gave you the narrative of here's the mechanism, but the truth is there's a lot of things that are baked into that program that you would say, well, that's different from what you're talking about today. And so we actually, we did follow up studies with the youth who have been through the BAM program to really pin down this mechanism more directly. And why do we care about the mechanism here? Well. In this case, if you want to scale that program, and there's lots of things, so there's 26 weeks of material, that's very expensive to deliver. And if you want to scale it or take it to another place, you might say, well, what is, how do we distill down the most important active ingredient? Well, that's where the mechanism studies become important. Now, there's probably some interventions out there where they could be cheap enough to deliver where you don't actually have to know why it works. You just need to know that it works. And so to the extent that the cost is not going to be the limiting factor there, then the mechanism study may not, it may not be an important part of it. For us, it was important because we said, well, if you want to take this to another city, what's the strongest prescription we can make or the thing that we think is most important? So that's why we focus on mechanism for that. Makes sense. And I was really interested in um, the, your discussion about that because your whole thing about you're trying to say, when does someone decide that whole pathway? And I found that really interesting of, of, in terms of, because I was thinking about the domestic violence things. And, but for us, and, and my team know way more than I do, but the, and I totally agree with you, the simple ones, we don't know. Like, you know, the re reminder, 
it, it works. It's really cheap. Fine. You know, we think a reminder is the thing that does it, but could it be, oh, my God, they're on to me? I better, I better go. Like, they're shadowing me. They're here. You know, we, you know it's, there's speculation there as well. And on some of them, of course, like the, the plain English one, we did not test that. We just, it's kind of just it's like the bleeding obvious. You couldn't read it. It'd be good to know if you can read it and, you, you know, you have half a chance of doing it. So there's some things we, we didn't test for. The what's the plans the um, and, and the app which is still being in development. The what's the plan one for me is so interesting because it goes more to your point about trying to say, can you think about things? Can and it's that, that sister one, system two thing which is um, what we're trying to get at. Can, when you're in the moment, and, and to be frank, this is this is the moment when you often you have committed a crime. Um, in that moment, can you change the way you're thinking? But it's also your example as well with with the with the young men and and trying to say, can you bring the temperature down almost and do something different? But I find it um, challenging to... to the, the more specific you are, then the, the easier it is. But it's, the, it's trying to ratchet up to the complexity, the, where we want to go, that we've, we've, we've got many more things happening. I think it's much harder to pinpoint. Yeah, and I agree a lot with what's been said already. I mean, what I would add here is that knowledge of core principles of psychology will really elevate your ability to do this type of work. So really understanding how attention works, how memory works, how motivation works, the things that are the fundamentals behind where some of these nudge type interventions come from, if you, if you understand that, the reason you'll be much more effective is that these types of things tend to be very context specific. And so if the way you approach this work is to say, well, here's these top five nudges, and I'm gonna kind of pull them off the shelf and throw them into the field, you will find that most stuff doesn't work. I, in my experience, you really need to start with a design process that asks a lot of questions about will people notice this, what constraints are they going to have on memory, and so on. And then from that, either kind of generate something new or to the extent you start to get inspiration from some of the classic nudges, you think about them in a more sophisticated way. Um, and that's probably, I mean, that's one thing that I think if we do more of that, we'll start to actually generate more types of interventions and also start to have a little bit more sophistication about predicting when and where these things are, are likely to work in a way that we don't do so well right now as a field, I don't think. Mechanism, so, you know, the other reason why you might care about mechanism is, so suppose that we took, we did the body cam study in another city or we did BAM in another city or something, and we see that it doesn't move the administrative outcomes that we thought mattered. There's two questions, right? One is, does the program not work? Or two, is this situation very different? And if you have some measure of the mediating mechanism, you can say, well, the program changed the channel through which we think this works, but it didn't change the outcomes. Then that might suggest, okay, either the link between the mechanism and the outcomes is weaker, or there's a reason why this, this particular city or this context makes it hard for that mechanism to translate into the outcomes that you care about. So it lets you understand a bit more about why it might have failed if it fails. So something like social norms, for instance, of which the mechanisms you actually laid out are where some of the theory is here. But the way it might cut is that if it's just an information conveyance where you realize you're way off the distribution and it motivates you to go search for information, that's one thing. If it is instead prompting you to make kind of evaluative judgments about how you fit in with a group you care about, then suddenly what a social norm even means who you consider your social peers is a place where I think this, this type of intervention often gets underthought mm -hmm. and starts to have design implications for, you know, how are you actually capturing what population you're describing? Is it the right one of relevance to the individual that you're talking to? And so if you know you're on that mechanism track, it can cause you to dive deeper on making sure you're getting all of those parameters right. Because something like a social norm is really, I mean, it's not like a thing. It's like a, it's like a panel of 20 different knobs that you have to turn to get that, that high level concept to work right in a context specific situation. Mm. What happened to the body cams? So in the, in the district, we had already made a decision that all officers were going to get them. Ah, okay. And where the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but still wanted to, still wanted to know, in part yeah. because there are still a lot of remaining questions about additional elements of how the cameras operate. So for instance, one of the things that we're running tests on, not in the field at the moment, but with, with in the like academy, and then we'll go back into the field, are questions about when, whether and when officers should be able to view video footage in relation 
to when they write their report, mm. right? And this is a place where you might worry about the viewing of it distort what people write because they focus only what's on in the video footage or they start to edit it. I think there's a compelling thought that the most accurate way to increase the written report itself would be write it, view it, you can change it, but it's all track changes. But that might be in direct tension with what fact finders, jurors, judges, et cetera, make of it. They might view that as flip-flopping. Mm -hmm. And so how do we actually measure what's actually happening here and then make some policy decisions as a direction that's going? Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that the possibility of the video footage being useful as evidence in court, that is actually the main thing that the police department, the court system was interested in. Most mm -hmm. of them didn't actually expect officer behavior to change, although that's the typical public one. And that's one where we still have a lot more work to do. Mm -hmm. So the estimates we have in those are much, much larger confidence intervals just because we have sparser data, the events are less frequent. And this is a space where how attorneys and judges are using the video footage, which is a new thing, is still a lot of open questions. And mm -hmm. so I'm telling you the outcome on the admin data, there might be lots of things we can do to use the video footage better at the right time in the right ways that could increase the evidentiary value in a way that we don't detect in the first study. And I think, I think that's where the frontier of what's going to be useful. And also looping it back into officer training would be another illustration. So David, in the District of Columbia, am I right that you went from no body worn cameras to this as a new initiative? But there are other states that have the body cameras on police. Yep. So um, are you, are there, is there any research on those? Yeah, so there's, there are now several different evaluations of body cams, some of which have already happened, some are in the field. Mm -hmm. Um, most of them are pre-post or randomizing at the shift, although a few more randomizing at the individual officer level are coming out. Uh, they tend to be smaller, but these are still, I mean, this is, I say that not to dismiss them as evidence. They're good studies that we pay attention to. And if you scan the field, the results aren't in a straight, consistent one of the story I told. There are some places that show um, some reductions in use of force, others that actually show increases in documented uses of force. I think there is some coherence that comes if you filter a little bit on the, the quality of the studies, and I don't mean that as a critique on the researchers, but in terms of the sample size, how good the access they had to administrative data, that leads to my kind of punchline on, there could be some places where this is useful, but that big hope of big average reduction sh shifts across the police force is one that, yeah. at least I've, I've kind of calibrated my expectation on that down. Yes. Yeah. So you know now, if you, if you took the, body cameras off? Like, is there a behavioural shift once the other way? You know, if you say, okay, you don't have to wear them anymore because we found that, we, but just the, just removing something, does it change the behaviour? Mm. It would be an interesting one as well, I think. Not I'm suggesting don't do you it. do it, don't do but, it. Don't yeah. <laughs> well, if we do, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to you guys, down here. Could you stand up and say oh, who you sure. are? Sure, I'm Alex Gianni from the Behavioural Insights team. Uh, one of the mediating mechanisms that was mentioned was the visibility of the body cam. So I was wondering whether you tried like a high vis sort of fluoro version or one that had like a red light on it, and whether that might change the, uh, the behaviours. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah, the cameras don't have much fashion pizzazz to them, <laughs> unfortunately. But officers will verbally notify that you're right. on camera, right. if they can, which isn't always possible. But... Um, so I, yeah, and, and I mean, I guess another direction you might go, I've not actually done this, but for places that have the cameras on glasses, like maybe you might think those are more visible. What are they seeing? Um, but I don't know. I, I do go back to thinking it's asking quite a lot of someone to notice it, particularly mm -hmm. if it's a heated moment or you're in an altered state of mind because of drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these interactions do happen in those kind of situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. On this, but I was just curious, like, how did the police officers' union react when they're rolling out the body cams? Or how did, like, you could frame it as this is oversight, or you could frame it as this is evidence that's gonna, you know, reveal that you didn't do anything wrong. I'm just curious how you got bought in from buy in from the police. How many people thought officers would want the cameras? And how many thought they wouldn't want them? <laughs> So it's, it's the opposite. Officers really ah. wanted the cameras. So, it, so I actually ah. had the weird situation of in trying to enforce the randomization scheme, trying to make sure officers assigned to the uh, control group didn't sneak over into the treatment group. Because most officers are good. Like, I mean, I can tell you this now, after being around cops for a long, a long time, most of them mean well, uh, are decent people, and the few cops that are doing bad things, they're like, the hell with them. They're causing our whole profession 
problems. And they're giving us a bad rap. I don't, I don't care about them. And so their focus was a little bit more on some of the frivolous complaints that come in, of which there are some, and thinking that the cameras would actually be protective for them on that end. This isn't true everywhere. So I, this is a statement about the district. Um, and this is not a super, I didn't do like a big survey or anything. So this is you know, conversations and things like that. Um, and I don't know how it would play out in some other departments. Questions? Yes. You're allowed. <laughs> Great. Hi, Hi I'm Ashley from the Behavioral Economics team uh, here in Australia. Uh, the theme of this conference is New Frontiers, and it occurs to me that each of you have spoken about an intervention that kind of sits within its own topic area. But, you know, when we think about something like domestic and family violence here in Australia, we're also probably thinking about how that's affecting the children in those families, the youth, you know, how that impacts their lives going forward. Um, perhaps they become parents themselves one day. Uh, you know, they're going to potentially, people are interacting with the system, you know, they're interacting with police officers. And so is the next stage in this kind of research then looking at how all of these interventions, which sit in their own area, might actually interact with each other or could be... Uh, you know, maybe that next level of multifaceted types of, of things that could try and maybe weave some of these things that are working together so we're getting a more holistic view. Um, I guess there are challenges with that. I'd be interested to know your views on yeah. that as a next kind of new frontier. Can I say I was really interested in Anjun's um, work because it was about this, a similarity of can you bring the temperature down type of approach mm. where, um, you know, uh, is it, what's it BAM stand for again? Becoming a man. Becoming mm. a man. Mm. I mean, it's really, for me, I felt that there was sort of a, a, an intervention that you could see. It, it's so similar. It's about trying to say, can you, can you stop and think and, and, mm. and do something? And I thought your results were astonishing. I mean, you must be mm. really pleased with those exceptionally good results that I thought that, that you got. I mean, compared to, often we, we claim our results because they're way better than nothing, but sometimes you look and they're going, could you just lift your game a bit, you know? So I, I was thinking of that. And, and, and it's also, if I can add to it, um, I think about domestic and family violence, but I also think um, about our issues around child protection and abuse, similarly, because often, um, families or parents will have a court order and the court order will, will, will be about the conditions about which they're meant to, so that they don't lose their children. There are certain things they have to do or, or, or not do. And it's again a similar thing. Can you understand the order? Um, how can support workers help you when you're on your own? What, what, what sort of plans have you got to be able to, to cope with that? Sometimes it might be you're in strife, but won't you ring your mum to come over? So it's a I, I found that sort of also putting things together, both within but also across. Yeah. Um, so maybe so one thing I can say. So we we are pleased with the results, although we we can't take real credit for the program because Youth Guidance, this organization in Chicago, they developed it. Uh, they also have one uh, for adolescent girls called Wow, working on womanhood. So they're, they're very good with the acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know one of the things that we're thinking about in the next stages. So not just, OK, what's the mechanism? Why does this work? But uh, and I think John talked about this this morning. What are the things about Chicago that made this the right intervention for Chicago? Mm -hmm. And where are the other places where this might work? What are the features, put it more generally, what are the features of the situation that we captured here that we need to be sensitive to when we take this elsewhere? Because there are some interventions where you can say, well, got a pretty good sense that this is going to generalize, right? Text message reminders, I've got a pretty good sense that that works because people forget the same way everywhere, right? But turning the temperature down, that you need to be sensitive to many more things. And this is one thing that we don't know from what we did in the SPAM work yet. We only know why it worked here or there, but we don't know if we want to take this to DC or New York or Houston, what are the things that they should be paying attention to in, this, in terms of the situation? couple of things. I mean, one is that I think we're hitting more examples and proof points through body cams, through the CBT training and things like that of interventions that are getting more and more complicated in terms of what it takes to deliver them, but seeing that the kind of core approaches of paying a lot of attention to the behavioral audit, the psychology of what's likely to happen, coupled with the value of weaving in 
evaluation methodologies, including randomized ones, but you know, as far as you can get in that direction, is an approach that can be used to tackle some of the biggest social problems that we have. And so as a field, it's gaining momentum to just get government to be more empirical. The second thing I would say that I certainly have experienced this with the lab at DC and also when I was at the federal level, and I think a lot of the teams are doing this, is that because of the positioning they're in and working with a lot of different agencies, they're just helping facilitate coordination on problems that span across traditional bureaucratic silos. And so, you know, we have a program now that's out in the field where officers are now getting a little bit more discretion for low-level offenses, not to actually arrest someone, but to drive them to a mental health professional. And the hope is to connect them with social services quicker and avoid an arrest record. And there's things like that that, you know, this is government. So, like, just knowing people and having a channel to get different people from different agencies together to talk about a similar problem is another, is another place that, you know, it's not uniquely behavioral insights other than it's, like, how behavior of people work, but having teams that are cutting across policy areas, I think that's, a, that's another function they can serve. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name's Andy Singer for the Australian Institute of Place Management. Um, perhaps a question for you, Marianne, is uh, um, if Behavioral insights is to make an impact. Uh, would it be um, uh, timely to place a, a behavioral insights team within the Department of Justice uh, rather than uh, Premier and Cam uh, Cabinet? Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to turn up to the, um, the session which talked about uh, scaling up uh, experiments, but uh, there must be a lot of areas within policing and justice and crime which... Um, could benefit from these approaches, and, I, and I'm just wondering what the inhibitors are to going right. to scale. Look, it's a, it's, um, it's a question um, in New South Wales. We've actually had a, a unit in our Family and Community Services Department for a while, but it didn't, um, didn't last, if I can put it like that. Um, at the moment, the, the issue would be, um, I think, around it's really hard to get these exceptionally talented people and none of you can poach them. <laughs> that are in, and I'm serious about that. These people, um, you know, they don't just, um, you know, just grow on trees. Um, one, there's, it's a, in, incredible expertise. Two, they're eclectic. So you can't just go, I'll have a psychologist and I'll go out and get 20 of them. It, and I think that's the beauty of our team and no doubt it's the beauty of all good behavioural insights team is that you do need a lot of different different types of people, and in, in a small, you know, relatively small place like um, like we are, to, to to get them in one place is very very powerful. I, I think that because they learn from each other, they share information with each other. But then the challenge is that we have to work. Um, the team has to work really well with be it justice, be it family, community services, be it education. And I'll be honest about this, um, those partnerships vary. Some of them go, oh, fantastic, I've been waiting for you all my life, you know, come and help us. Others are going, you, you've got to, it's kind of like what you're saying, you, you have to actually get them on board and, you know, talk mm. about this, this as a different approach to doing it. And one of the biggest things will be, of course, it costs money, so people have to pay for these things, and you don't get the results tomorrow. Like, you know, you mean we're going to, it's going to cost this long, it's going to take this long, and I won't know for three years? <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. So it's, it's a lot of work to embed that in a, in a government, I think. And because, I mean, I, it, we've come such a long way since um, 2012, I, I would keep going because I wouldn't want to use, lose this, this um, you know, this concentration of expertise. But the challenge is, is always for us getting out, getting partners, getting the message. And I'm looking at the team here. Would that be, if I kind of answered that question okay for all you? You think that's about right? Cindy? I'd probably just add, um, thanks, Marianne. Um, I can understand that we might be located in... We might be located in DPC, but actually we work across all New South Wales government agencies and departments. And so while it might seem that we are concentrated and everything Marianne said is true, uh, we actually are um, putting in a lot of effort into building um, behavioural uh, economics and behavioural insights capacity with our partner agencies and, and sort of bringing them along on the journey with us. So, yep, thanks. 
We're running out of time. I might just try and squeeze one more question. So first hand up, up the back. Th thanks very much. My name's Harry Greenwell. I'm, uh, I work in the behavioural economics team of Australia Beta. Uh, I wanted to go back to a point that David made, and maybe this is a question for both David and Anuj about methods. I was really interested that you spent some time emphasising the use of a pre-analysis plan to support mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, the rigour of your uh, study and also the trust that uh, people had in the results. Uh, we we uh, in beta are also very keen on using pre-analysis plans, but uh, we haven't gone to the, the lengths that you did in involving the community in the development of those. I guess uh, what I was interested in is, first of all, your reflections on uh, how the disciplines of psychology, economics, and also government evaluation are shifting in terms of the use of pre-analysis plans and your sense of uh, whether, whether there is momentum behind uh, this movement, but also your reflections on some of the challenges. I mean, Marianne's just talked about the difficulty of uh, establishing the patience within government to conduct a trial, and then you're asking for the additional patience to go through what sounds like it was a pretty lengthy process to develop the pre-analysis plan itself. You want to try to make sure it's sufficiently thorough to anticipate all of the difficulties that might emerge once you conduct the, the analysis at the, at the end of the trial. Uh, I'm just interested in a bit more in your reflections on that, because it does seem to be fundamental to the discussions we're having uh, about rigour in testing. So, yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, one thing, I hope they start to spread based on this conversation uh, with everyone, but admittedly, they're not super widespread right now. And you know, the, what people are doing in a pre-analysis plan is quite variable as well. So like I've, I've talked about this before from people in the medical profession, like, oh, we've been registering trials for 15 years. And you look at it, and the way they register is like, we're doing a study on this drug. And it's really not in the spirit of what we're talking about, about trying to lay things out. But I think it's worth it. It's worth it not only for the research integrity reasons, it's worth it not only for the kind of value inputs I was talking about, although I will say that how in depth you need to go there depends on the project. Body cams is pretty unique, right? Like, I'm not doing 20 community events on changing a letter or something like that, unless it's a really, really important letter. And so you can calibrate that part. But the other thing I would say, that a benefit I would hit on that is just always true, is it's a tremendously valuable project management document to just get people on the same page about what we're talking about. Another element of this for me is that the fact that we publicly register them just helps capture attention from busy government people in a way that nothing ever does until they know it's going public, mm. right? And so <laughs> actually forcing people to get serious about what we're doing, it facilitates that. Mm. And the last thing I would say here is that the thing that trips these up is usually just misunderstanding about what they're about. And the most common thing that I'll hear is, well, you can't, you can't like, things might change. I might need to do analysis slightly differently and so on. Totally you can. The pre-analysis plan is not meant to prevent you from doing things differently after the fact or having exploratory analysis. What it does is it makes transparent that research arc. So if you do something differently, which you totally should feel empowered to do, I have done it myself, it sometimes happens, but your reason needs to be something better than like, oh, I didn't like the result. Right? Like you need to have an actual defensible reason and it forces a transparent discussion about why it is. And so if you're in that world, I think it's a great document. We should all do it. Any quick responses from either of you on that question? No. Well, okay, I'll go. I just, I just <laughs> know there's tea outside. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, so, are, we are getting there. So one, another reason why it's helpful is suppose that you're working with a, a partner that is concerned about the kinds of analyses you might do you can sort of say, look, here, here's the scope of actually what we're looking for, and that's a way to get buy-in from them. And if you do the work for them, in terms of outlining the analysis, it also doesn't require anything extra from them. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Oh, right. okay. So just by way of closing, uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation this afternoon, and thank you to the panel for your generosity in sharing your work and, uh, and to really going into some depth on the methodology of the projects that you've engaged in that have really gone across individual and systemic nudges, which I think is, um, is there's great interest in that. And I just wanted to reflect on the fact that in this um, area of crime, uh, that uh, these projects really demonstrated 
some humanity and compassion for potential offenders as well as for victims. We talk so much about the victims, but uh, which is in contrast often to what we hear about in the whole law and order field. In fact, did anyone see Four Corners last night? Uh, there was it was a documentary about in, from the states about um, teen offenders and li um, lifelong sentences, which you will know all about, which was news to me. Uh, but and the changes that are happening there, and so I think you know this discussion has really given me some hope, uh, and and really I'm drawing on the the humanity and the compassion of. The, uh, the work that you're doing for all concerned. So thank you very much and please join me in thanking you.